slide, uh, slides right now. And let me first say, it's actually a privilege for me, Brian, uh, for, for two reasons. One is I find this, this, my research really interesting. And so every chance I have a chance, uh, I get to talk about it is, is actually a benefit for me. So thank you. Number two, I have the great privilege to work with companies all over, uh, all over California all the time. Uh, I'm funded by the small U.S. Small Business Administration, and so at no cost to companies, uh, I uh, am paid to help help them with supply chain issues, product design issues, manufacturing issues. And there is actually a team of ten of us. Uh, half of us are engineers. The other half are lawyers and business people and, uh, and uh, financial planners. And so the, our group of 10 people uh, are all paid by, uh, by the government. And so uh, we're here to, here to help you. And, uh, and so that's why it's a real privilege. And as part of that, I get, an, I get access to a tremendous amount of data. And so what I'm going to share with you tonight uh, is from the companies. And so I'm actually quite grateful for all the companies helping me uh, find out where they are and what they're currently working on and, and, uh, and, and their movement as they grow as companies. So I'm going to tell you four stories tonight, okay? And, uh, and I've got 30 minutes, so I'll divide them pretty equally along that. And I'll, I'll kind of spell out these stories for you, okay? And the whole overall objective is to tell you just what's going on in this industry. I, uh, Michael used the term landscape. Uh, I'll give you a landscape of what's going on in the biomedical industry. And the first three stories are about the Bay Area, but the fourth story is actually an international story. And so I'll share that uh, in the end for you. Okay, so the first story is this. It begins with, uh, uh, with this map right here. And when I first started doing this, uh, this assignment uh, for the Small Business Administration, I got some advice uh, from some people who said, you better know where the companies are before you start trying to help them. OK, uh, in other words, you just, you know, you can't just assume they're in a place and that they'll come to you. You've got to actually find them and go help them. And so since 2013, we've been gathering information on where all of the companies, and I mean all of the companies in the biomedical industry are located. And our database includes all of California right now, uh, but I'll focus on the Bay Area tonight. And so I make presentations, and in fact, for the first kind of couple of years, I used to make presentations and, and I used to show this slide and everyone would gasp and go, wow, that's a lot of companies. And this is over 2000 companies in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of companies here and, and they're in everywhere from biotech to pharma, to, uh, to medical devices, to medical equipment, genomics, digital healthcare, as well as contract research organizations and contract manufacturing organizations. So a really robust industry here in the Bay Area with, like I said, over 2,000 companies. It's the largest concentration of biomedical companies in the world, actually. Uh, there's other, other clusters in the United States. Uh, the Cambridge, Boston area is very strong in, in, in biotech in particular. Uh, so, is, so is San Diego. But the, across the entire biomedical umbrella, uh, the Bay Area has, uh, has the most companies with way over 2,000 actual companies. And so anyway, I showed this slide and everyone would go, wow, that's a lot of pins. And I thought, well, that's, that is interesting, but maybe I could drill down a little further and try to tell a more robust story. And so I started dividing the companies out by sector and it came out with some pretty surprising results. So I'm gonna show those in the first story. And the first story is about industry sector biomedical opportunities, all right? So here's the first one. The first one is biotech, all right? so. We had this huge area of, of firms, of, of pins before, but biotech actually is fairly focused in a, in a couple of uh, geographies. First of all, and I, I'll use my, uh, uh, well, hopefully you'll know the geography here. I wanted to use my cursor, but I don't have a cursor here. Uh, but if you know South San Francisco, just south of San Francisco, uh, you'll know that uh, that that's actually the birthplace of the biotech industry. Companies like Genentech are located there. And there's a very significant cluster of biotech companies in the range of about 150 to 200 companies just in that one city. All right. Everyone knows that, uh, who knows the industry here in the Bay Area. They know that that cluster is there. But what they don't know is just how many companies are in Silicon Valley. So if you look south of South San Francisco and south of San Francisco, actually, in, in cities like Mountain View and Sunnyvale and Palo Alto and Menlo Park, 
you'll find another two or 300 companies, closer to 300 companies that are biotech companies. And so one of the first kind of takeaways is that when you go from, you go from this big group of companies here, okay, clustered all over the Bay Area, and you look at biotech, you see that biotech is quite clustered in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, uh, South San Francisco, those two areas. So that's, that's the first thing. Now, that's interesting, but here, let me make it even more interesting. If you look at what happens with pharma, it, it tells you just what happens as companies uh, start manufacturing drugs. And so here we're very focused in South San Francisco and, and Silicon Valley, here spreading out to places like Livermore and Pleasanton and, and Richmond and in, into the, uh, Marin County uh, and further through San Jose. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are much further, uh, uh, further afield and more, uh, more spread out because they're looking for larger footprints so they can manufacture. So those of you as, uh, that are biotech early stage biotech companies, there's a lot of good reasons to be clustered in places like South San Francisco because of access to resources, especially money, uh, but also talent. Uh, but as companies move on and start manufacturing their drugs or, or pharmaceutical companies that actually uh, are, are manufacturing further, uh, are, are manufacturing in, in, in continuous production facilities, they look for places that have much lower cost uh, and bigger, bigger spaces for them. So there's a lot of companies uh, pushed into places like Palo Alto and South San Francisco, but places like Fremont and Livermore and further afield, uh, those places have much bigger facilities where you can get your production up, line up and going and, you, and your head counts much lower as well. Uh, so you don't have to have, don't need that many people. So this is the first story here is here's biotech, here's pharma, uh, both around about, about 600, 600 companies each uh, uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. So a total of about 1,200, uh, 1200 companies in the biopharma uh, part of the biomedical industry. But let's move on because the next is really, really quite surprising. And this is medical device companies. So you, you see what pharma looks like. You see what biotech looks like. Here's what medical devices look like. All right. And some of your companies might be a combination device. Some of them might be considered medical device companies. But over 80% of the companies that are medical device companies are south of the San Mateo Bridge. So right in the middle of the screen is a little white line across the San Francisco Bay. That's the San Mateo Bridge. Over 80% of the companies are south of that bridge. So all through Silicon Valley, but into San Jose, up into Fremont, uh, even up to, into places like Newark and, and Union City. And so this industry moves, this sector of the, of the biomedical industry moves much further south and is clustered into this, the, the lower South Bay uh, and in very close proximity to Cuba actually in, uh, uh, in, in San Jose. And so a much different geographic pan, uh, pattern, almost none of them in San Francisco or Berkeley or South San Francisco, but a real uh, uh, clustered sector down in the South Bay. Okay. And medical equipment, now medical equipment uh, is, uh, is things like operating tables and high-end treadmills and, and, uh, and therapeutic uh, kind of equipment. And these companies are also in the South Bay, primarily in the South Bay, uh, with a few, a few exceptions as they've grown up into the, the, east, uh, the eastern part of the East Bay and east part of Alameda County. Uh, so this is an interesting pattern as well. These companies need more space. There's a very significant cluster of about 50, maybe 60 uh, medical equipment companies in Fremont, in Fremont alone. So Fremont is a place where you go to scale up your hardware. Uh, and so, uh, so that's another pattern. Uh, an up and coming industry uh, sector is, uh, is the genomics industry and, uh, and digital healthcare. This is digital healthcare first. And if you'll notice that digital healthcare companies are almost exclusively in places like Palo Alto and San Francisco. San Francisco has over 100 digital healthcare companies. And in many ways, these companies are much more like tech companies than they are uh, life science companies. And so you'll have all of these digital healthcare companies uh, clustered in very small spaces with very low headcounts, four, five, six people, all working on either an app or a piece of hardware that has, has a very strong digital component to it. So San Francisco and Palo Alto are the real clustered areas for these, these parts of the industry. 
And then finally, genomics. The genomics industry is also in San Francisco. It's very data intensive, as you can imagine, but also through the valley, especially in places like Palo Alto and Mountain View. Uh, so six different segments of the industry or, or sectors of the industry uh, with very different uh, locational patterns. The reason this matters is, is as a company, you're, you're driven by finding resources. Resources are your lifeblood. And so, yes, you need money. And so when there are companies nearby that are in the same sector as you, uh, the money is nearby. Uh, if, you, if talent is what you need, companies that are similar to what, you, uh, what you're doing, uh, if they're nearby, then you have better access to talent. And so those two alone, as well as other things such as having economic development people and planners from cities understand what you do, that's important too. Some cities, South San Francisco, for example, they get biotech. They understand when a company comes to them and says, this is the kind of uh, permit we need for our sewers. This is the kind of water we need. This is the kind of power we need. Uh, they, they get it. Uh, same thing with Fremont. Fremont gets it if you, if, they, if you come in there and you say, we need to scale our facility uh, and we need to do it very, very quickly. So there's a lot of reasons why you follow your competitors. Because as you know, in this industry, there's not a lot of like stealing secrets. That's not the way this industry works. Uh, but instead, being close to your competitors gives you access to the resources that they also have and have developed, okay? So that's story number one. I wanna, I wanna stay on task here and get to a couple more uh, stories. So story number two uh, goes back to this big, uh, big group of companies again, and, uh, and I call it microclimate uh, biomedical opportunities. And, and it all started one night when I was messing around with the data. And there's this little switch up on the top of my screen called toggle heat map. I didn't know it was there because I paid someone to do the programming for this, uh, this map. And so one night I was messing around and I just clicked on it by accident and my pins, these pins right here, turned into this heat map. And I went, wow, that's fascinating. Look at that. You know, you, I can say there's lots of pins in Silicon Valley and Mountain View in particular and Palo Alto, but look at this heat map actually shows it. And so then I got real interested and I thought, well, maybe I could do some calculations to figure out if quantitatively there really are clusters uh, by city. And so I cal calculated what are called location quotients. A location quotient is a real simple ratio. That's all it is. So I looked at, let's say here, my example is the city of Fremont. So it's the number of medical equipment companies. There's 68 of them. The total number of companies in Fremont is 18, 000, over 18,000. So it's 0.36% uh, uh, of, of the companies in Fremont are made up of medical equipment companies. I looked at the same ratio for the state of California. And then I put the two of them together and came up with uh, a locate, what's called a location quotient of 3.64. And as economists, speak about this, uh, they say anything over 1.5, anything over 1.5, 1.75, maybe even two, is, is considered a significant cluster of an industry. As you can see here in Fremont, uh, 3.64 is quite substantial. There are other cities all over the Bay Area. Uh, Emeryville, for example, has an 11, a location quotient of an 11 for biotech. And, uh, and other cities around the Bay uh, have, have, uh, have fours and fives and sixes for the location quotients. And so I went through and I calculated location quotients for all of the cities in the Bay Area, uh, for all of the different sectors and even support sectors, engineering, sensors, software. Uh, and then I said, hmm, where are these clusters? And so then I put them back on a map and I came up with five really important micro, what I call microclimates or clustered areas. Berkeley Emeryville is one, Fremont's one, Silicon Valley, the four cities I'll talk about in a second, South San Francisco and San Francisco, all right? And the point of this story is that why are these clusters so significant and what's drawing the companies there? So I went out and I interviewed about 60 people who are CEOs at these companies uh, in each of these clusters and about 10 or, 10 or 12 people per CEOs per cluster. And I tried to get a sense of, just, hey, what's going on? Why are there these clusters? Because you know, if, you, if I told you there are 2,000 companies in the Bay Area in the biomedical industry, you might just think, well, because of cost or because of commuting, they're probably evenly spread. It's quite the opposite. That's where that heat map comes in. They're actually not evenly spread. 
they're quite clustered into what I, I have called dubbed microclimates. And I put cute little names on them too. So, and this is based on what I found out from the interviews and the data. So I call the Berkeley Emeryville cluster uh, research commercialization. I call the Fremont cluster scale up. I call the Silicon Valley cluster or microclimate integrated products. Proximity pipeline is South San Francisco and industry emergence or technology emergence is San Francisco. And let me tell you the little micro stories for each one of these for these microclimates. So here's the first one. That's the Berkeley Emeryville one. And so here's what it looks like. All right. So first of all, there's over 150 companies, close, close to 200 companies now uh, in Berkeley and Emeryville. Over half of them have, their, have roots to UC Berkeley or Lawrence Berkeley Labs. All right. They're a quarter of the size by average, by number of, of headcount. 85% uh, of people have at least a bachelor's degree, and many people have master's degree, where over half the companies have master's degree, people have master's degrees. And so it's a really highly educated uh, group of companies that are small, are linked to the university, and most are, are early stage with some type of federal funding, funding usually small business uh, innovation research grant, SBIR funding, and a lot of venture capital funding as well. There's 10 incubators in this uh, Emeryville Berkeley area as well. And so the first microclimate is this, what we'll call, uh, you know, kind of a early stage research commercialization cluster or microclimate. And so when I give this talk to college students, I tell them, what's your personality? Do you want to be in that kind of early stage, high turnover? Oh, and by the way, the, the uh, death rate of these companies is twice the average as well. So high death rate, small companies, federal funding, uh, links to the university, uh, and clustered in Emeryville and Berkeley. That's the first microclimate uh, that, uh, that is very significant here in the Bay Area. All right. So that's microclimate number one. Microclimate number two couldn't be more different than this one. And this one I call scale up. And this is, this is, uh, this is Fremont. Fremont has over 100 uh, companies, mainly medical device and medical equipment. They're twice the size of the average. So we had tiny companies in Berkeley Emeryville. We've got companies that are twice the size of the average in the Bay Area uh, here in Fremont. 50% uh, of the jobs go to people with a high school or a two-year degree. So remember what we had? We had these super smart people with lots of degrees up in Berkeley Emeryville. Here we've got actual, you know, middle skill level jobs in, in Fremont. And in other words, companies move to Fremont when it's time to grow up and start making their product. These companies live longer. Most of their funding comes from either revenue from their own products or comes from uh, some type of... Uh, uh, you know, institutional or corporate investment funds. So very different as a microclimate. So that's number two. And again, a different personality than, than Emeryville Berkeley. Number three is called integrated products. And that is, uh, uh, that is the Silicon Valley group. And this is, this is Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Sunnyvale and Mountain View. Over 200, over 300 companies are here. High location quotients also in software, electronics and semiconductors here. And it's called integrated, I call it integrated products as a microclimate because it's highly, the, the companies here are highly integrated with other industries. There's usually a software component. There's often a sensor component. There's definitely some electronics for lots of the medical devices and medical equipment. Highly educated group of people with lots of funding and lots of connections to Stanford. So this third microclimate is called integrated products. It's more you know, spread out. It's the most spread out of all of the microclimates, uh, but it's pretty significant with over 300 companies in these four cities, okay? The fourth microclimate is what I call proximity, proximity pipeline, and that's South San Francisco. Now, those of you familiar with the industry, you know that probably over the last 20 years, there's been a significant change in how research is done in big pharma uh, and by big biotech companies instead of having it under their roof, they've looked outside to have a pipeline based on companies that they have loose partnerships with or that are even just close by. And so South San Francisco has continued to grow with more and more companies, over 200 companies there now, because they wanna be close to companies like Genentech, like Merck, like AstraZeneca, that have a presence, like Johnson & Johnson, that have a presence in South San Francisco. And so by being close to these big companies, they can get their attention. They can get attention of 
corporate venture capital as well as private venture capital. They can get access to lots of talent from a lot of the companies nearby. This is a five square mile area in South San Francisco, east of, of Highway 101. And there are over 200 companies just stuffed into a, that little area. And so it's a pretty intense area, but a lot of venture capital is there, a highly educated uh, group of people as well, as we talked about, uh, but very specialized. This is biotech and pharma almost exclusively. It's not hardware at all. It's not really genomics or, uh, or digital healthcare either. So it's a really focused group there. And that, so this is the fourth microclimate. And then the fifth is, uh, the fifth one is uh, technology emergence, and this is San Francisco proper. So San Francisco has over 200 companies uh, in its city limits, and a large, large propor proportion of these are in digital healthcare and genomics, as I talked about earlier during the first story I told you. And so this is a highly educated area, high location quotients for software and engineering services as well, lots of incubators, lots of venture capital here, but very focused on digital healthcare and genomics. It's expensive to be in San Francisco, the most expensive real estate, particularly down south of market in the financial district, but there's a lot of companies in, the, in, in those two sectors clustered in that area. I call it technology emergence because geno uh, genomics and digital healthcare are the two fastest growing emerging uh, parts of the industry. Okay, so there's your there's your your five different microclimates, very different from one to the next, uh, serving different types of companies. And so, as a company now, if you're in Cuba and you uh, center and you're not going to stay there forever, there are different options for you to be in a different microclimate uh, to benefit from different resource sets. So that's the takeaway from that story. All right. So uh, let me go to the third story, and this one's related to the second one. And this is on industry cluster uh, biomedical opportunities. All right, so back to my little, little uh, heat map here. Not only was I interested in what these clusters look like, I wanted to see if there was any relationship between the different cluster, uh, microclimates, okay? Were they just independent of themselves and their relationships were actually external from the Bay Area? Or was there a relationship within the Bay Area between the microclimates? That, that was a really interesting question for me. And so I started looking at data and here's the data I looked at. I looked at between 2014 and 2020, what was the movement of companies like within the, within the Bay Area and external to the Bay Area? And so I tracked 100 companies that have moved and by moved, I mean, they actually picked up and moved to a new location. 45 left the Bay Area, okay? 55 stayed in the Bay Area. That's the one of the biggest takeaways right off the bat. Because if you talk to most people who don't know the data, they know companies, they've, they've heard of a company or two that's moved to Texas or moved to Nevada or someplace. And so right away there, they think that's the pattern. 55 of the 100 or 55% of the companies stayed in the Bay Area. This table is pretty shocking actually. So none of the companies that moved of the 55 companies that moved, moved to Berkeley Emeryville. Companies just left Berkeley Emeryville. And so if you look at, uh, take a look at this, 21 companies left Berkeley Emeryville and here's where they went. Seven of them went to Fremont, five went to Silicon Valley, five went to South San Francisco and four went to San Francisco. That's really fascinating because I went and interviewed uh, many of these companies said, hey, why did you move? And you know, what, what drew you to this new location? Uh, none of the companies from Fremont left, okay? It's just companies moved to Fremont. And you look at Fremont, look at seven came from Berkeley Emeryville, nine came from Silicon Valley, uh, five came from South San Francisco, uh, two came from Sa San Francisco. So 23 companies moved to Fremont from within the Bay Area over this, uh, this six year period, okay? And so that's really interesting data. Again, like I said, 45 companies left the Bay Area, okay? And they, uh, having talked with many of them, they, they left to scale up their production, to lower their costs, okay? That's a given, that's a strategic reason. But 55 companies stayed, that's the interesting question. So let me talk a little bit about why, why they did that. So here's what happened. The research companies, the research commercialization companies up in Berkeley Emeryville, they moved to Fremont to scale up. They moved to San Francisco to have access to talent. 
They moved, some of them, if they were biopharma companies, they moved to Proximity Pipeline or South San Francisco so they could be close by to the AstraZenecas and Merck's and Genentech so they could get noticed. And some of them moved to Silicon Valley because that's close proximity to the venture capital industry, but also to other types of, of, of companies in software and sensors and other, other industries, hence the integrated products. So all of the four other areas sent companies to Fremont. Fremont didn't send any companies away. Uh, companies moved between South San Francisco and San Francisco. Companies moved from South San Francisco to, to Silicon Valley. But what it shows is a really interesting pattern. So as companies scale up, you know, go from research and startup to growth to scale up, they choose different locations in the Bay Area. So in other words, there are strategic reasons for why companies move. It's not just, hey, it's cheaper. It's, I want to move to, to Silicon Valley so I have access to venture capital. I want to move to South San Francisco so I have access to that, that pipeline of the big companies that are located there and are scouting the smaller companies looking for opportunities. I want to move to Fremont because I need lots of space to scale up my production facility. And so the takeaway from this story is quite simply, there are strategic reasons to move. So make sure if you move, so if you ever leave Q Bay Center or anywhere, wherever you're located, move for strategic reasons, okay? That's really what has helped these companies thrive because they've moved for the right reasons. All right, so that's, that's story number three. Let me spend a little time on story number four now. And it's a quick one, but it's an interesting one. And Brian gave me the green light to, to tell this story. So it's a five minute story, I'll be quick. All right, so here's a global picture of the, of the biotech industry. There's, there's about 14,000 biotech companies, and these are just biotech. This isn't medical devices, medical equipment, just biotech. There are 14,000 biotech companies in the world, all right? Back in 2010, all right, back in 2010, there were, uh, there were about 80% of the companies were in the U.S., now in 2020, or in 2020, we're in 2021 now, but in 2020, when I gathered the data, only 60% of the companies were in the US. Hmm. So has the US lost its groove? You know, have, 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 they, have the companies been moving to other parts of the world? That's what made this research interesting. And so here's what I looked at. I looked at, hey, where's all the growth? So some of the leading places in the world that are adding biotech companies, Singapore, China, Czech Republic, Poland, South Korea, even South Africa and Canada, all right, as well as Hong Kong. But the U.S. still is growing at 11.6% during this time period, okay, during a, four, uh, during a six year time period from 2014 to 2020. And, you know, within this whole range, this is 25 countries here, within these 25 country range, you know, we all, uh, Switzerland's even at, is at the bottom with 10% growth. And so these are the leading 25 countries for growth in the biotech industry during this time period. I was fortunate to have data on a number of factors to try to figure out why, all right? Because that's the question. Why, are the, why is the industry growing in different countries? And so I looked at leading life science universities. I looked at life science patenting. I looked at healthcare spending. Uh, and I looked at government investment in life science research. I found data for most of the companies. I, my data set was about 100 countries. And, uh, and so I found data on most of these, these indicators for all of the 100 countries. And so then I just ran a regression analysis on this. My, my uh, dependent variable was the change in the number of biotech companies between 2014 and 2020. All right. And my independent variables were all three of these, uh, these, uh, or sorry, all four of these indicators, leading life science universities, life science patenting, uh, healthcare spending, and government investment in, in life science research. And so I just ran the, ran the analysis. And so here's what I found. Signif and right here on the, on the right-hand side are the significant variables. So top universities, top life science universities, that's the most telling uh, independent variable. So a very significant, very strong uh, uh, identifier of why a country is growing in, in, in biotech is, do they have top life science universities? Se a, second, a second indicator uh, is, uh, is patenting. How strong is patenting in life science? That leads to biotech companies. Uh, and then 
Healthcare spending, though it's significant, is a very small percentage of, 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 uh, of explanation. Same thing with uh, government R&D funding, but both significant and an adjusted R square. In other words, almost 60% of the explanation for variability is explained by this, these, uh, just these four variables. I put in a couple more variables like gross domestic product and ease of doing business rank and neither of them were significant. So here's an interesting kind of summary slide then. Life science universities on this, this X axis, on the Y axis, life science investment, and then in yellow are the patent leading, leading countries for patenting. And so U.S. continues to lead. So no, they haven't lost their groove. Uh, they still are a strong location for the biotech industry. But Japan, U.K., Switzerland, Denmark, and Israel and South, uh, South Korea are all in that upper league here, uh, especially U.K., Japan, Switzerland, Denmark, and Israel, and a couple other countries there. But the ones in yellow are the ones that are leaders in life science uh, universities, leaders in life science investment from the government, and in patenting. And so it tells you, these are some of the places to keep an eye out for real growth in the biotech industry. It took a while, but other countries have developed the infrastructure that's necessary for a growing biotech industry. So you, the US isn't the only player now in the world. So that's the, that's the fourth story. I just thought I'd share that with you quickly. So there are the four stories. I hope I've shared a little bit with you about where the industry is located, where the opportunities are in the Bay Area, this whole idea of cluster and strategic reasons for moving, and then finally, the global picture. So I'm open to any questions you might have, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm always uh, uh, open to your, uh, your, your, uh, your emails as well. So there's my email address. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. It's a really nice presentation. Yeah, I never thought about um, from the point of view of uh, geography to think about the clusters before. It's really interesting talk. Never heard of it before. Nice. Thanks. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, if you're in the Zoom, you can just unmute yourself and ask directly. I have, I have a question, Greg. You know, it's so inter interesting. Um, I run a little medical device company. And, um, you know, for instance, when we were looking for sterilization um, services, we found in Fremont a company that does e-beam sterilization. <laughs> yep. And it, um, I just wonder, um, you pointed to a lot of factors. I, I, I wonder if these factors are more synergistic than anything else in that, you know, when you have other growth stage companies in a certain area or, you know, digital health in, in a certain area, do they attract the kind of consulting and resources into that area that, that create the, these environments? Yeah. Um, that yeah, end up that's, a, that's an excellent point. That actually is the case. So when I talk about developing support industries, that's why I looked at these other uh, location quotients. That's what's going on. I, I guess to get to the bottom of this, I think it probably works in both directions. Mm -hmm. A few companies locate there, some of the services move in, that leads to more companies uh, moving in. I mean, I got a real variability. I've surveyed these companies for the last six years and they'll tell me talent drives a lot of their decisions, uh, but access to supply chain, that drives their decisions. Uh, helpful cities, Fremont happens to be really, really supportive of companies and their growth. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it, it, it's a range of, we'll call them business resources uh, that really, uh, really uh, have driven the growth of these, I call them microclimates, uh, but uh, clusters or micro clusters uh, within the Bay Area. You know, when they, uh, uh, there's been a couple of these kind of surveys done on tech companies before, and they always point to this kind of uh, um, tripod of resources in the Bay Area that make this such an interesting place for tech, which is um, the funding, mm -hmm. the talent, and, and the big acquisition companies that come, you know, and you want to basically have all three if you're building a, a company where you want to um, find an exit or a partner or something. And so, you know, I wonder how much of that is also coming into play because, I mean, the resources and, and the access to this stuff is also very important. But I wonder if you looked at venture capital funding, and firms, would you also find clusters in some of these areas too? And and 
Yeah, I think, yeah, and I think tech's an interesting example. I would add a fourth leg to the stool and that's the physical resources, the, the supply chain resources and the actual physical uh, facilities. Many of your, uh, you're in medical devices, so you're a little more flexible. Uh, you can get by with clean room facilities, but the folks who need wet labs and need hoods and that type of, you know, kind of even just waste, uh, waste uh, management facility uh, capabilities, those companies need that, that fourth leg of the stool. And so, yes, money, yes, talent, yes, acquisitions, but also the physical infrastructure. That's why QBay is so important. Uh, QBay offers those types of physical resources. And uh, there are 10 incubators in the Berkeley Emeryville area, for example, for the same type of reason. So you're, you're right on. Uh, I, I, but I think I would just add a fourth, a fourth leg to that stool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I, Thanks, yeah I think Benjamin's question is really interesting. If you do a heat map for the investment, do you also see the same cluster? I assume actually the investment in the very early stage, probably the most, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, probably more money is going, is going to go into the San Francisco first and least is going to go into the Fremont because the, all of the companies are already very big and very profitable. So they need less investment. Yeah. Well, you're right, Michael. Uh, the patterns are quite different. Uh, Berkeley, like I said, Berkeley Emeryville was a lot of federal funding. Uh, SBIR was the main funding uh, source for companies, small business innovation research grants. That was the main source of funding as well as university funding and some of the other kind of, uh, kind of the University of California has, a, has a, uh, an incubator startup fund. Uh, so those are the types of funding in that area. Uh, Silicon Valley was a lot of private money uh, San Francisco, South San Francisco was a lot of corporate uh, venture capital. So Merck uh, would fund things, uh, um, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca. These companies had their own funds. And so a lot of the company, a lot of the kind of, we'll call it corporate v uh, VCs uh, were part of the story in South San Francisco. And, and so, yeah, different microclimates, different sources of funding as well. Uh, that, that's what made this fascinating. You know, the fact that we have a cluster here and people act, you know, if anyone's from outside the Bay Area, you know, there's these, you know, you, you think of a cluster as being, you know, pretty homogeneous. Once I dug deeper, I found just how varied the different we'll call microclimates or micro parts of the cluster were in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that's why that third story really jumps off for me. The fact that as companies move, they move for strategic reasons to get closer to the resources they need as their company is maturing. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have another question. Actually, it's uh, the cluster doesn't surprise me. We have a cluster for all of the bars, restaurants. I mean, everything is in cluster, but that doesn't surprise me. But when I see the, 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 the table you made, there's nothing to do with GDP for, for the, the growth of, the, of this industry. That surprises me, actually. So, um, it's, it's, you, you mean the GDP on, on the international? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, actually, that is one of my variables. It just wasn't significant. Yeah, I know, but uh, still. Well, you thought it would mind. be. Yeah, I, th I thought it would be very, very. Yeah, so did I. I, I did too. I mean, that's the reason I put it in there as a, as a what we call a dummy variable. Uh, and so I thought it would be significant. Um, I, you know what I think it is, is I think when you look at the top 25 uh, countries, you, you know, the GDP probably, and it's per capita, by the way, I, I, I levelized. Oh, it it's per capita. per capita. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so when you, you levelize it per capita, I mean, you, the numbers are pretty close nowadays. I mean, there was a time after World War II when, you know, there were uh, some countries that were way ahead, but, you know, Switzerland, you know, is on that list and all the way up to Singapore and per capita GDP is pretty close for most of the world now uh, in that club of, of 25. Uh, and so I think that's probably what's happening in the larger data set, you know, a data set of 100, 100 countries, you know, top 25 are probably pretty much in the same league. Uh, and that's why it came out as insignificant. Uh, but I think if you looked at it across the whole world um, and maybe tried to spell it out for one country versus the other 99, then you probably would find a significant uh, a relationship. But once it, but when it's looked at it in a group way, I think it's uh, it's less likely to be a significant variable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Greg.
Any other questions? Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, again. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank, to share. thank you, Greg, for, for sharing the great picture with us. And it's, it's really astonishing. I never see the, any presentation like this. It's really marvelous. So it's, I really appreciate your help. If you could leave your slides to, I mean, leave some link with us, I, I, I would be happy to, to have those for. Yeah, my pleasure. Sources. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, Okay, our, our second talk is going to be given by uh, Teleplus Healthcare. The Teleplus is a platform that provides the chronic care management and provides the education software to hospitals as assistant livings and MD offices. Uh, they're focusing on the management of COVID-19 recently as well. Um, tonight, Susan, who is the co-founder and CEO of, Tele, uh, of uh, the Teleplus is going to talk about it. Susan, are, are you here? I'm here. Um, so if you want, I can share my screen. Okay, go ahead. So let me just put it into a uh, slideshow. Here we go. So first, um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Greg, a uh, fabulous talk, very interesting about um, um, the dynamics of startup and um, and health tech and uh, just global uh, healthcare. Um, we are, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Suzanne Chug. I'm a uh, CEO and co-founder of Teleplus Healthcare. We are a global chronic disease management platform. What we do is we, we actually have three platforms. We have an education platform where we're partnered with a uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, we have an eight year exclusive partnership with uh, UPenn for um, uh, remote sleep management and sleep diagnosis. So I'll go into that in a little bit and that's uh, primarily in Asia. And then we have, um, we're focusing on gaps in care in, in the US and in Asia. So um, hard to treat chronic diseases and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. So uh, again, we partner with hospitals, assisted livings, insurance companies, provider offices, and in Taiwan and Asia, um, actual clinics. So we do remote monitoring um, to monitor the poorly treated chronic care conditions. We, um, we have patented algorithms and we have, um, we collect data from remote devices and this is coupled with our machine learning. Um, so what we do is we're, we're able to prevent disease exacerbation and prevent re-emissions. So my background is uh, I've been in healthcare for about 20 years now. I started out as a, actually an RN in uh, cardiothoracic surgery and I became an NP and then I um, graduated and I became a lipidologist. In fact, I'm the only lipidologist in New Jersey and don't worry if you don't know what that is because no one does. So um, I specialize in complex uh, metabolic and lipid disorders. So people who have, who keep having heart attacks or strokes, um, genetic dis disorders and it creates a really high number. So um, my whole focus in care is, is in prevention and actually fixing people. So um, I say to people when I see them for their, their lipid disorders, if you have to go back to the cath lab, I failed because I figure out what the, the underlying problem is. And now we have medicines to actually regress plaque. So I, I put this into um, our practice and how I met my co-founder who's actually Taiwanese and he's actually from Silicon Valley. I'm based out of the uh, East Coast. So I'm in about 25 minutes outside of Manhattan. He's in Silicon Valley. Um, he was actually um, with another telehealth um, company, and I was um, in charge of healthcare for a partially self-funded insurance company. So I knew that I needed to work with telehealth companies in order to keep the cost down. So that's how um, we met. He's got an engineering background, just like Greg, and um, has specialized in software and hardware. So we make a good team. So I'll go on and, and speak more about our team, but I just wanted to sort of give you a little background rather than just diving into what we're doing. So um, currently we are doing um, heart failure and cardiovascular disease in the US. Um, we've decreased our re-emission rates from 25%, which is the average national average to 3.4% over the last 20 months. So um, saving millions of dollars for the practices we're in. So we're revenue positive in two different um, markets. So um, just to give you a little background on chronic care. So um, a third of our population is greater than 55 years old. 
Um, we keep aging, of course. We have no other choice except for her to be under the ground, right? Um, of that third, 78% of them have at least one chronic condition, and we're expected to live at least 19 years with that chronic condition. Um, the average cost of each admission to the hospital for that chronic condition is about $15,000. Um, and 15 to 25% of the population gets readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. So in other words, once they get hospitalized for a chronic condition, they get discharged, about a fourth of them will get re-hospitalized within 30 days, which is very costly. Um, so what we're aiming to do is prevent that to actually help improve care, um, decrease healthcare costs, um, and make providers more accountable for the care they're giving. Um, so right now the telemarket value, we know it's a huge market. Um, it's about $25 billion and expected to grow uh, you, by about fourfold to $101 billion by 2024. Um, and explain how we differentiate ourselves from the, the, the crowded market. So um, our US platform, we have a complete end-to-end -end platform. Um, we have transition care and chronic care management. Um, we have treatment algorithms for each disease we treat. Right now we're focused on heart failure, um, hypertension. Um, we're doing long-term management of COVID-19. I'll explain that in a little bit. And then we're also doing a, a four-day remote medically monitored detox. We're the only ones in the country doing that. So very interested that uh, we have a whole bunch of companies interested in, in partnering with us for that. Um, our platform also has um, time and keystroke tracking. So it, it fulfills all the needs for, for billing and auditing for CMS and, and other insurance companies. We have patient education videos for each disease state in different, um, different languages. We have remote telehealth visits, um, consent forms, IT management. So we have a whole support system built in and we can integrate into electronic medical records uh, as long as they give us permission. And of course we're HIPAA um, secure. So we, we are secure. Um, from lots of different perspectives. We're um, on the Amazon platform. Um, we're partnered with at and So we've been um, one of those companies approved um, by the FDA as a small business. And we also are approved for emergency medical care through the at and So um, we have lots of different security systems that make us unique. So we qualify for that. Um, our focuses are, um, again, COVID-19 extended monitoring cardiovascular disease the four day remote detox and sleep disorders. And we're, we're primarily focusing on sleep disorders in Asia because it's really an untouched disease in Asia. So <clears throat> I'll go into that further, but, but the Asian population because of their craniofacial structure, 42% of them have sleep disorders, so the craniofacial structure and also genetics. Um, so they have a narrow uh, craniofacial structure which makes them more likely to have sleep apnea and that causes a whole bunch of different health conditions, um, primarily cardiovascular conditions, diabetes. So it, all these diseases are interconnected. So that, that's one of the reasons why we created this platform. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is actually our, our healthcare provider management platform. So we actually divide it into three different sections, need to call, need to review, and then complete it. Like you don't have to you don't have to deal with, with that. And we color code it and risk, um, we rank the, the patients by risk. Um, so it's a very complete platform. We were able to partner with the largest health tech company in Asia, a company called JagTech, which are our partners. So they have a very large um, IT service behind them. Um, so we have support so we can grow not only in the US but in Asia. Why they benefit is they want to enter the U.S. market, so it's beneficial to both companies. So our U.S. partners and providers, uh, we're partnering with Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, some of the other insurance companies were in talks. Um, we have an eight-year exclusive um, uh, relationship with the uh, University of Pennsylvania for their um, whole sleep education. We have an online sleep certification, um, so you get a UPenn um, certification for sleep medicine. Um, physicians in Asia do, which is uh, really unique. Um, and then we have a whole management platform behind that. Um, we're, we are, as of next month, we're also going into the senior care living space. Um, so we're going to be 
treating, which opens up a whole other market. So we're gonna be treating um, cardiovascular disease and other diseases in assisted living. We've also partnered with other um, devices such as Samsung, Walgreens, um, body metrics, um, all these devices that are um, FDA cleared. This allows us to be agnostic and be very um, flexible to partner with different companies. Um, one of our largest partnerships that's been recent is um, a company called ResMed, which is in Taiwan. It's the largest sleep uh, medicine um, supplier in, in, uh, in Taiwan. It's got a big presence in Asia, um, in China as well, and in the US, but particularly in Taiwan. So how we work, <clears throat> how our, our business model works is we have a SaaS business model. So we are we have a, a management platform which we sell to hospitals, assisted livings, and MD offices. We are reimbursed by every insurance company, including Medicare, Medicaid, on a monthly basis. So it's a recurrent revenue. We also then sell products to patients. So we have several different areas of revenue, B2B and then B2C. And then the insurance companies want to partner with us as well because we save them money. So it's a win-win for everybody and we provide better care. So I'll give you a, an example of how we work. So on average, um, the way the healthcare system has worked, um, hospital systems now have, have basically purchased all the different groups. So they, they're they now a big conglomerate and they actually purchase all these practices. So on average, there's about 40 card cardiology practices per US hospital groups. So just in New Jersey, there's 72 hospital groups. So about 2,800 um, cardiology practices. Um, in RWJ Barnabas, which is Robert Wood Johnson, Rutgers and Barnabas Health, which is the largest healthcare system on the East Coast, um, they have 52. So how our model works. So if a practice has an average of 135 patients, which is not a lot, we get paid $133 by the lowest amount we get reimbursed per patient per month for 12 months. Um, it brings in an additional revenue to that practice of about $200,000, which of $33,000 is paid to us. We charge a flat fee, um, and then we charge an additional $25 per patient after 25 patients. And then we also make about $10,000 per practice um, for the, the products, um, and that's about every two years. So just the New Jersey market has a potential of 30.8 million if you're just looking at 25% of the market, just to give you the numbers. So our revenue models, um, both in um, the US and Asia, and why we've, we've focused on the two different um, areas is again, we're focusing on, on gaps of care. So in, in Asia, less than 1% of the sleep disorders are treated and they really don't have a, a solution. So in 2018, um, patients waited an average of six months to get a sleep test. Um, there was only in all of Asia, including India, there was only 80,000 home sleep tests done in the whole year for that, that whole population. The, the population is enormous and I'll go into the numbers in a second. But so <clears throat> it's a huge opportunity that no one's been able to, to cross just because they don't, they don't have all the different parts. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, so just going into back to our revenue models, our B2B is to the hospitals, the assisted living, the facilities and the, and the um, clinics. Our B2C is, is the, the sale of the products to the patients, as well as we, we charge a, um, a membership to join our monitoring platform in Asia. So mm, several different areas of recurrent revenue. So to go over the numbers, just to give you an example, 600 million Asians suffer from sleep disorders. Again, that goes back to the 42% of the population that suffers because of cranial facial and also genetics. Less than 1% of these are diagnosed and even less are treated. In all of Taiwan, there are only 390 trained sleep physicians. In all of Asia, it's less than a thousand. I mean, this is a huge population and there's really no training. So there's so there's becoming more and more uh, understanding of how sleep disorders really affect health because when you don't sleep, it causes diabetes, it causes atrial fibrillation, it causes heart failure, aging, a whole bunch of different 
metabolic diseases, not not to mention the risk of stroke and sudden death. Um, so it's an enormous problem that's being more and more recognized. People just haven't been able to solve the problem. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, we've created a, a 20 online module um, program to help um, providers recognize, screen for, um, read sleep tests, and then also be able to manage, remotely manage these. So we can, we can um, remotely manage um, the sleep disorders by when they have a home sleep test, the data uploads to the cloud, we then get it to the tech who then gets it to the physician who then relays it to the patient. The patient then purchases a device on our platform. They get sent home. Um, we're then able to remotely have them fitted for it where then when they put it on and they then upload the data in the morning, we're able to look at the data and see if they have a mass leak, see if they have a hose leak, see if their pressures are wrong. So we can remotely manage that 95% of the time. So how, how we've completed this, this sleep solution. So as I mentioned before, we have the sleep education. We have the in-office in sleep screening. So we actually help the offices get started by having um, a member in there go through the questions and, and helping the office get into the, or the clinic get into the routine. We then make money off the home sleep testing. We then transfer the, the device data and, and management to the doctor. And then we make money off the device recommendation and sale, and then the remote management and, and practice. And then again, you have to replace the equipment. So we complete the cycle. So our roadmap. So um, in 2021, we want to expand throughout New Jersey, New York, and PA through hospitals and clinics. Um, we're in talks with the, the VA, especially they're very interested in our four-day remote medically monitored detox. Um, um, we have partnerships, like I said, with JagTech and then also with ResMed. And it's very beneficial for ResMed to partner with us because they then get physicians educated so then they get to sell more products. So it's a win-win for them. ResMed has never, has never partnered with any other um, telehealth company in the past, and they have actually fronted us a million dollars in equipment. Um, so we're able to get scaling and moving. Um, so our, our target is 2024, 2025 for um, ideally acquisition, or we're open to IPO as well. So funding, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. It's 10 o'clock at night. So here I'm on the East Coast, so I apologize. <clears throat> so we've raised about 300K in our angel funding. That was, that was primarily from the, the founder, myself and my co-founder. We've raised an additional $2 million and that's helped um, pay UPenn and build our three platforms. We are expected to get another, an additional million dollars by the end of this month by a repeat investor. It's a, it's a fund. And then we're looking for another um, 500K to close the A round. And then we're already in talks with several companies for the B round for 5 million, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Just for the allocation of capital for the 500,000. And this is for US only. This is just to expand our, our, our current market. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, our team so my co-founder is 50% time in Taiwan, 50% time in, in, in Silicon Valley. He's got startup, uh, he's got startup um, experience in the past. He's also um, brought a company public very successfully. He's an uh, engineer background um, and he's, um, he's had lots of experience in um, software and hardware. Our CFO is actually um, just finished the process of raising $110 million for App Harvest. He's also sold a company previously to Siemens. And then our, uh, our chief marketing officer has written several books. He's, he's um, worked for, I believe it was ABC in the past as a journalist. So a very successful team. Myself, I've, I've worked in uh, various different areas of insurance healthcare. And again, I, I still practice medicine on very different um, levels. Um, 
the one last thing I'll mention is we are now we are now making revenue in two different markets. It's been a little bit delayed because of COVID, but in the last four months in Asia, we've uh, I think we just broke the hundred thousand mark. In the U.S., <clears throat> we've not grown as quickly as we wanted to because we've had to allocate most of our funding to Asia because of the UPenn connection, and we had to make um, decisions on where to scale our business. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Susan. Um, Sorry, I lost my voice. <laughs> and no problem. That's a really nice presentation. <laughs> and uh, I'm in Boston as well. It's kind of late right now. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. that. No, I was up since five and I started, I was seeing patients all day. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, are there any questions? I bored you guys all to death, huh? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I have, have a question for that, actually, for the data side. Uh, so, so for example, if you want to do like the sleep management and uh, um, any kind of management, uh, management, actually, the data source is uh, most fundamental um, resources you need to have. How, how are you going to dealing with that? Uh, collaborating hospitals and how, how is the source? So they want to give us our data. And the reason why they want to give us their data is they want us to keep their patients out of the hospital. So with in, in regards to our algorithms and management, our sleep management and algorithms are all, we actually hired the consultants that built, um, with permission from UPenn, that built their whole remote management for their sleep um, platform. And we actually patented it. We got permission from UPenn to patent it. Um, as for our heart failure, we've actually built the platforms and the data management with various different experts in the field, and then we patented it as well. So our idea is, is or not our idea, but our what we're doing is we're actually looking at patients' past medical history, um, what their family history is, what their medications are, and looking at how all of this data um, coexists and looking at future diseases and how it implicates patients. So it's not just, hey, we're keeping them out of the hospital and we're, we're trying to mitigate readmissions and keep them well. Um, as patients use our platform more and more and more, the, our machine learning actually gets to know them. So I'll give you an example. When we're doing heart failure, a lot of it has to do with blood pressure, weight, how they're feeling, how they're sleeping, how they're clothes fit. So, it's a lot different for if you have a patient that's 350 pounds versus 110 pounds. So 110 pounds, you get a very small change, but that means that patient's going downhill, whereas that 350 pound guy, you need a much larger change to put him in the hospital. So it, it just starts picking up patterns after our, our system starts picking up patterns. And then we look at all the data to start predicting other diseases as we go on. Yeah. So, so, so my question, a part of my question is, uh, once we have the data, actually, it's a lot of things getting much easier. We know what to do with, we know the algorithm, how to analysis that. But uh, according to my previous experience, the, the data-driven uh, startups, the most difficult thing is data source. So a lot of companies are buying the data from hospitals, like the EMR, as you said, and also a lot of from claims data, like from Chuvin, from IMS, and also from some of them from a uh, patient self-report. So, um, um, just we need to probably um, have a clear clue that how the, 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 the data uh, source problem, because sometimes the hospital doesn't want to give the data for free. They can see it's okay. It's uh, out of the like uh, confidentiality and stuff like that. But uh, um, Okay, so let me explain one thing that we do very differently. So mm -hmm. like if you look at, and I'm not picking at any specific company, but Teladoc, MD Live, what they do is that when they're dealing with these chronic care management and they're, and they're uh, managing patients, they hire outside docs. So because of um, um, laws that you can't, um, I forget what it's called. It's, um, I'm drawing a blank right now. When you can't, um, you've not covenant, but um, because you, you practice for one practice, you can't practice for another practice. Um, I can't. Um, it's not patent laws. It, it's um, when they have uh, clauses when you get hired by a company where you can't work for another company. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's um, clause. Yes, thank you. So, 
So what happens is the hospital then hires outside doctors to manage their patients because their doctors can't work for that telemedicine company to manage their patients. So they don't want to let go of that data. What we do is we actually partner with the existing hospital and use their doctors. We just give them the management platform. So their doctors are the one that are, are looking at the data and then we're analyzing the data. So then we pick up the patterns after that. So that's how we're able to get all the data. And our whole entire team is HIPAA certified. So everyone on our team, everybody on the IT team has access to that data because we're all HIPAA okay. certified. Okay, it sounds like the model of the IBM Watson. So they also do similar things. Yeah, so, so right now, I'll, I'll give you an example. Right now, when we're in our cardiology practice, Blue Cross Blue Shield also is managing their chronic care. Yeah. yeah. Chronic heart. But their system picks up our patients three days after they've been hospitalized or after we've, we've intervened. So we'll say there's, there's a problem coming up, there's a problem coming up. And then three days later, Blue Cross's Blue Shield, their um, heart failure says, hey, you know, there's a problem. We're like, yeah, we already dealt with it three days ago. So we, we've had that a bunch of different times because, because they're not on the inside. They're, they're, they're looking at it from the outside. So that's why our technology is superior. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we're able to treat the patients more effectively. Thank you, Susan. Is there any other questions? Okay, then uh, uh, thanks for your talk, Susan. It's, it's very uh, uh, great. And we, we also learn a lot from the talk. Thanks for the um, opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for participating uh, for our event at this time. And, uh, and uh, I really appreciate your, your participating. If you have any other questions, uh, you can, all, uh, also connect with us, me and Dan and Greg, I uh, mean, me, uh, Brian can, can all uh, answer those questions or uh, transfer that to the speakers for you. And uh, thanks a lot, everybody. I really appreciate uh, being here tonight. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye.